But good morning, everyone. Um, I know more will be trickling in, but let me get this show going so that we can um, continue with our day. Uh, happy Thursday. My name is Zachary Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Kristen Godsey, alumnus or alumna from um, UC Berkeley and um, just prolific writer and researcher who um, has been producing books and books and books of just uh, wonderfully interesting information. To go back a little bit, I had the pleasure of me meeting Professor Godsey back in 2010 as a grad student with Maria Bucher at a cultural studies symposium. And probably since then, I've always wanted to have you come do another lecture. Um, so <laughs> it's very exciting to finally have you after a decade of being at Berkeley, get you back in a quote, quoted sort of way. But let me do a more proper introduction. Um, besides just my own personal uh, <laughs> part of it. So Kristen Argotsi is an award-winning professor of Russian East European studies and a member of the graduate group in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her articles and essays have also been translated in over 20 languages and have appeared in publications such as Descent, Foreign Affairs, Jacobin, The Baffler, The New Republic, Quartz, NBC Think, The Lancet, Project Syndicate, Le Monde Diplomatique, Die Tage Zeitung, German's not my best, um, <laughs> The Washington Post, and New York Times, She's also, also the author of 10 books, including Second World, Second Sex, Socialist Women's Activism, and Global Solidarity During the Cold War, Duke University Press 2019, and Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence, bold type books 2018 and 2020. Um, and it has 15 international editions, so if you don't like to read in English, you can probably find something else that meets your standards. Um, her latest book is Taking Stock of the Shock, Social Impacts of the 1990. 89 Revolutions from Oxford University in 2021, co-authored co with Mitchell A. Orenstein. She's also the host of the podcast AK-47, 47 Selections from the Works of Alexander Kolontai. I'll put the link um, in the chat once we get started, um, which inspired her forthcoming book with Verso, Red Valkyries, Feminist Lessons for Five Revolutionary Women. So if you need some summer reading, I would start with the 2021 book and get ready for the 2022. Um, so it is my pleasure then to let Professor Kristen Godsey speak to us today about East European typewriters. And please note that this is um, a very new project. So you're gonna kind of see live action processing of information. So um, I hope that intrigues you as we listen to stories about East European typewriters. So Kristen, please, by all means, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much for that generous introduction. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. I hope this works. Um, all right, there we go. So can everybody, is that, I hope you guys can see that. All right, so I'm gonna, um, yeah, good. All right, I got a thumbs up. So, um, so the name of this presentation is Cold War Keys, The Curious Life of East European Typewriters. And I know uh, Zachary just mentioned this. Whoops, let's see, I've got to get this to, yeah, there we go. But I, I really want to emphasize that this is very, very, very much a work in progress. I have a kind of amorphous and voluminous amount of information that I have collected on various East European typewriter models. And I'll give you a little bit of background on why that happened. Uh, in a bit, but I'm still very much in this early process of trying to figure out exactly what it is I want to do with all this information and how I'm going to frame it um, and whether or not anybody's actually really interested in, in these um, objects, these uh, bits of material culture and what, and what they can tell us about the lived experiences of socialism and post-socialism in the 20th century and today. So I want to start this presentation by referencing a film that many of you probably have seen. Uh, it's called The Lives of Others. Uh, it was a German film, and um, this was one of the original posters, which featured a typewriter. It uh, won uh, an Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film, and it's a, it's a sort of interesting representation of life in the German Democratic Republic. Um, and the plot, if you haven't seen the film, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but the plot really revolves around the existence of a secret typewriter. And so the typewriter and typewriter technology really is kind of this one of the stars of this film. Um, in addition to the actors, this, this material object, the typewriter, 
plays a really important role in the film because in the GDR, uh, typewriters were registered and uh, the Stasi, the secret police, were constantly trying to regulate who had access to typewriters so they could know what literature was being produced and by whom. So there's also this really interesting memoir called Burying the Typewriter, uh, written by a Romanian writer uh, who won uh, a, a, the Bakeless Prize of the Breadloaf, Co Breadloaf Conference uh, a couple years back. And again, in the case of Romania, there um, was a very, very prohibited culture around typewriters. In fact, in Romania, typewriters were considered weapons as dangerous as guns. And I know that the um, this uh, page here is kind of hard to see, but it's the evidence of um, the Securitate who uh, uncovered the family's uh, typewriter, um, and then um, which was used as evidence to persecute uh, the author's family. Um, I was talking about this book with a colleague of mine in Paris, another um, French Romanian, and she said that when communism ended, the first thing my parents bought was a typewriter. Um, because she reflected, again, that typewriters were so extremely prohibited uh, because of their status as a dangerous weapon that um, they were extremely coveted by, by people in, in Romania during the communist era. And then this is a really nice quote um, from a Soviet dissident uh, from Soviet Samizdat uh, periodicals at the University of Toronto Library. And it says, I would erect a monument to the typewriter. And again, I think it's really interesting to think about the material culture of these objects and what they meant um, in terms of free expression and the ability to share and circulate ideas, particularly in Samizdat form. So I'm gonna come clean here and um, admit that I'm a bit of a typewriter aficionado. Um, I have a pretty copious collection of manual typewriters about I would say 57 of them at this point. I have one electric, but all the others are manual. Um, and for a weird set of circumstances, uh, sometimes I've been collecting for about 13, 14 years now, but I started actually by mistake collecting East European typewriters because I generally tend to buy typewriters when I'm doing my field work or when I'm abroad. And I started um, collecting these typewriters from Eastern Europe because they were relatively cheap. They're really interesting. I like the Cyrillic keyboards. Um, I have a, an example. I don't know if you can actually see this here. This is a, a, a Maritza, if I can get it to work. There it is, a Maritza. Um, two, uh, Marcy 11, um, with a Cyrillic keyboard. And um, I picked these up at flea markets and things. I, you know, I travel around uh, and I, and I basically go on these big typewriter hunts. And uh, part of having a collection of typewriters means that you want to have some information about the provenance of the typewriter, where it was made and, and um, when it was sold and to which countries and how did these keyboards get developed and what were the markets. And it turns out that there's a huge international, huge international group of people who collect office machines, not only typewriters, but old cash registers and things like that. But there's a big subgroup of this um, uh, club, international club of typewriter collectors, who are always really interested in the provenance of the different machines. And it turns out that there just isn't really a lot of information about East European typewriters. And so on some of these discussion fora that I participated in, I ended up getting a lot of questions from typewriter collectors, collectors who had come across these interesting East European models and really didn't know anything about them. So they just sort of asked, apropos of being a fellow collector, what do you know about this model or that model? And it sort of ended up sending me down a little bit of a rabbit hole in terms of learning about the history of these East European machines. So in 2017, I published a, a book called Red Hangover. And in that book, I wrote an essay called A Tale of Two Typewriters, which was um, a kind of an odd essay where I anthropomorphized two typewriters, one West German and one East German. And it sort of told the story of the deindustrialization of Eastern Germany after the reunification through the stories of these two typewriters. 
Um, and it sort of plunged me deeply into the history of the German typewriter industry, which obviously pre-existed the division of Germany after World War II, and what happened to the typewriter industry after 1949. And then very recently, as in just in the last, you know, I think couple months, I also published an article on the Plovdiv typewriter factory uh, in Bulgaria, which made the Maritza model that I just showed you, and about the memory of those typewriters and the memory of the horrible privatization of that factory in the 1990s and the bitterness that has resulted from the memories of this kind of botched, corrupt privatization of what was really a uh, kind of pride and joy of American, uh, sorry, of, of Bulgarian manufacturing. Um, I also Interestingly, because of the lives of others and because of reading this Romanian uh, memoir, Burying the Typewriter, I also got really interested in um, forensic typewriter analysis. So there are these, um, there were these experts in the United States who were very good at um, cataloging different typefaces of different typewriters for the FBI for the CIA, for domestic law enforcement. So this is the Journal of Criminal Law, Criminology and Police Science. It's an article from 1968. And this article was actually cataloging um, typeface and unit, space, unit spacing usage in typewriter manufacturers with a specific focus on typewriters that were manufactured not in the United States. And um, and so that in case Americans were using foreign typewriters to type things that were considered illegal, they could figure out um, where, what kind of typewriters those were and then use them as evidence against the authors of these texts. And so this created a really interesting list of, of machines for me to look at. And for the purposes of this project, at least as it exists now, which as I said, is very, very early on in, um, its uh, existence, because I'm not 100% sure yet what I'm going to do with it, um, I'm focusing on five typewriter models or five families of models. Um, so the first of these is the Maritza. That's a picture of the machine that I just held up for you, which comes from the Plovdiv typewriter works in Bulgaria. And, and the, the um, this is the model that I've spent sort of the most time thinking about because I was actually able to go to Bulgaria before the pandemic in 2018 and do some really detailed archival evidence, uh, research in the Plovdiv um, library. So the Plovdiv typewriter works resulted from a six, the sixth five-year plan and a decision that the socialist government in Bulgaria made to develop the country's domestic fine machine and electronics manufacturing sector. So the production of typewriters requires very fine machine work, skilled labor, and very strict quality control. So if any of you have used a typewriter, especially a mechanical machine, you will know that the soldering of the letter plates and um, to the type bars, the exact placement of the type bars to prevent sticky keys um, and to produce a uniformity of type pressure, the very delicate placement of the carriage and the correct calibration of the return bar um, require required initial tooling from the West, because this is really advanced machining that needs to be developed in order to make typewriters. Um, I will talk about this a little bit more later, but in Germany, one of the most interesting things about the typewriter industry is that after World War I and the prohibition on the Germans for making armaments, most of the Germans transformed the German factories that had been making guns were transformed into making office machines because the tooling and the machines are very, very, very fine, which is interesting because the, the same machines that make typewriters literally make weapons. So if you think about the wonderful analogy of, of words as a weapon or typewriters as a weapon is in the case of Romanian, literally the same machines that make guns make typewriters. They're capable because of the very fine tooling that is necessary to make um, these machines. So in the case of Bulgaria, they actually did buy all of the licensing, ironically, from uh, Keller and 
Knepich, um, which is a company that was an arms manufacturer, made office machines, and then decided to go back to making guns. And they sold the license to the princess model <clears throat> to the Bulgarians in uh, 1967. And limited production began in 1968. But the official agreement of the Plovdiv typewriter works was in 1971. Now, initially, the factory in Plovdiv could make between 80 and 100 machines a day in 1968. But by the mid 1970s, they had ramped up production and they were able to increase production to about 200 machines per day. The factory in Plovdiv eventually employed between 2,500 and 3,000 skilled workers from that city and its immediate environs. And the mass, the vast majority of the output of the Plovdiv Typewriter Works factory was for export. And some estimates that I found suggest that it was about 90% of the technology uh, of the production of this uh, factory was going uh, outside of Bulgaria. One source claims that the Plovdiv factory was exporting about 50,000 machines to Europe and about 30,000 machines to the United States. Um, and this does not include all of the exports that were going to Australia and to countries in the global south, of which there were many. So Marita typewriters found their way to about 45 countries and brought Bulgaria very valuable hard currency during the Cold War. And the Bulgarians were actually able to capture market share first through their relatively low pricing and a willingness to sell their typewriters under established Western brands. So the typewriter that you see in this picture is another one from my Connect collection. It's called a Bundy. Um, but a Bundy typewriter is basically just a Maritza typewriter rebranded. And um, this was done by the Bundy Typewriter Company, which is here in Philadelphia, um, which was um, made under, uh, they, they rebranded it as either Bundy or Omega. And it was a, a large uh, typewriter reseller in the United States uh, during the Cold War, and they were a huge importer of Bulgarian typewriters. So the, the American market actually was literally flooded with these typewriters. Even um, there was an old, some of you who are older will remember the department store Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward had its own branded typewriter, which was also a Bulgarian machine, which is kind of interesting. Uh, similarly, the Pacific Typewriter Company of Melbourne flooded the Australian market with cheap relabeled East European machines, mostly uh, from Maritza, but also from Konsul, which I'll talk about in Czechoslovakia in a moment. The Maritza 11 and 30 were exported and often relabeled and sold in the West as either Omega, as I already mentioned, but also Le Maire Pacific Crown or Waverly typewriters. So if you go into these typewriter databases, you'll see all these different names, but they're basically different names for the same exact model. Interestingly, these models all said on them, as you saw on that last slide, that they were made in Bulgaria. So, but domestically within Bulgaria, as early as 1968, about 2000 Bulgarian typewriters were available in stores and roughly 10% of production was sold to Bulgarians each year. In 1988 alone, the Plovdiv Typewriter Works reported, um, they reportedly made 170,000 manual typewriters and 5,800 electric models, which means that the domestic market received about uh, 1,750 machines. Now, these machines have taken on a kind of cult status. Um, and one of the things, because I'm an ethnographer, that I'm interested in is also the ways in which people interacted with these machines and how these machines sort of stand in for certain kinds of memories about the past. So this is a book the Inventory Book of Socialism. It was put together by Yana Genova and uh, Georgi Gospodinov. Um, and obviously this is a book uh, that kind of catalogs the material culture of socialism. And very importantly, the, the Maritza typewriter is, gets its own page. Uh, this is a Maritza 30 that you see um, here on the, uh, the left-hand side of this page. Um, one of the authors of this inventory book of socialism is the novelist uh, Georgi Gospodinov, and in his 
um, really widely acclaimed novel, The Physics of Sorrow, he has this wonderful passage where he's talking about the inanimate objects of socialism. And, and, and he's sort of bidding them uh, goodbye, these, these, these remnants of his past life. And he says in the novel, allow me to add a personal farewell to my Maritza, filled with cigarette ashes and coffee from the 1990s. Um, also, uh, my colleague at Ohio State University, uh, Teodoro Dragostinova, shared with me some memories of her experience of the Maritza typewriter in the 80s and 90s. And I'm going to read a couple quotes from her because I think it really tells you um, how this was like an email exchange that we had. And, and she was just sort of remembering details about her, her interactions with the Maritza typewriter. So she says, my dad bought our first Maritza in 1979 or 1980 after he and my mom returned from their two year long specialist exchange in Nigeria. My dad was then working as a researcher in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and was keen to write his travelogue about his stay in Nigeria. So he bought the typewriter. Uh, obviously, in Bulgaria, typewriters were much more easily available to the domestic population than they were in places like Romania or the GDR. Um, this is actually the first page of the memoir, This is Nigeria, by Koicho Dragostinov, uh, written in 1979-1980, um, and it was typed in a Cyrillic uh, Maritza, not so different, probably from the one that I just showed you. And so then here are uh, Teodora's, uh, some of her memories. I started using the typewriter in, my mid, uh, in the mid to late 1980s when I began typing my poetry on it. Uh, it felt as a matter of great significance to have my preteen poems typed. True, the paper I used was awful, thin, basically transparent paper, sort of rice-like paper, but very thin and fragile, so it tore if you hit the keys too hard. But the fact that I was typing them gave me great pleasure because I felt I was putting a small book of poetry together. We then also acquired a Latin alphabet Maritza. Not sure when and how, uh, that's the one I used the most, mainly in the early 1990s for my US college applications. It was really a great ordeal to type so many materials on this machine. I remember the keys constantly sticking, the ink drying out, I ran out of whiteout all the time, etc. I had applied for probably seven, eight US colleges in 1991 and everything, including my request for information and application materials, and I probably sent 20 to 25 of those, went through the Maritza. Now, this typewriter made me also very popular among my peers who did not have access to one, but similarly were trying to get their applications in order. This was the great frenzy of US applications when everyone was hoping for a full tuition waiver. I used to lend it out to friends in a complicated order, so there were always teens in my home waiting for their turn. And this is my favorite part. I even had a romance with one young man who was very ambitious, and who was sending a load of applications to various places. I still cannot tell you if he actually liked me or was there for the typewriter. He ultimately became a famous artist in the West and he probably wrote his materials to Parsons on my typewriter. And so as I said in this article that I just published, I talk a lot about the catastrophic privatization of this typewriter factory in Plovdiv in the 90s and how and the sort of psychic wound that still exists among many Bulgarians when they see or interact with these Maritza typewriters or the other models called Ebros. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the Unis TBM uh, from Yugoslavia. I did extensive research on this typewriter while I was living in Belgrade last November for a month. And um, this typewriter also has an incredible backstory and a very sad ending to it. Um, it was made in um, primarily in a very small uh, Bosnian uh, town called Bogonjo. Um, the headquarters of which was in, uh, of the larger state socialist enterprise, which was in Sarajevo, made in Yugoslavia. You can see there on the back of this typewriter. So in the mid 1970s, the 17th regular session of the workers council of the company Unis, which is the larger holding based in Sarajevo, decided that they were going to take uh, a portion of this factory in Bogonio 
and dedicate it to the production of Beser typewriters, Pearl typewriters, which was an earlier model of typewriter that the Yugoslavs were making. And they were going to create this independent unit for the specific production of office machines. They obtained a license from Olympia in Western Germany. And Olympia at the time was making a very popular model called the Traveler. There was the Traveler Normal and there was the Traveler Deluxe. You can see here uh, in the picture a, a, a Traveler Deluxe with a Greek keyboard, which was made in Yugoslavia. I'll talk about that in a second. But the Germans were very, very picky about quality control. So in February 71, the factory in Bolgogno sent 2000 typewriters to Germany for inspection. And the Germans were very impressed by the quality that the Yugoslavs were able to turn out. So over time, these models, the Unis TBM uh, typewriters were made in 92 different keyboards. And um, especially they focused on the Chinese and Arabic markets because Yugoslavia was non-aligned. And so the Chinese were happy to get these typewriters from Yugoslavia as a fellow non-aligned country. In the first production year, the folks in Bolgogno were able to export about 106,000 machines. And by the beginning of the 1980s, um, they were making between 1,100 and 1,200 units per day, um, which is about 500, half a million units per year, 90% of which was being exported to Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, the most interesting thing I would say about the Eunice TBM, and I, it's something that I'm still doing research on, is that the early machines that were being turned out from Bolgogno were either being marketed as Olympia Traveler Deluxe, or they were being marketed as Eunice TBM. So this is an Olympia, it's hard to see in this picture. That's got an Olympia branding on it and that one has the Eunice branding. It's the same exact machine, but one of them is very openly being branded as a Yugoslav typewriter and the other one is still being branded as a German typewriter. But for a long time, the little plaque on the back of the typewriter still said made in Yugoslavia. At some point in the 1980s, I'm not exactly sure why, I'm still trying to figure this out. The Germans decided to move, remove the plaque from the back of the typewriter. You could still see the two longer said they were made in Yugoslavia. So the Germans were selling Yugoslav machines as German machines. And the only way that you would know that they were made in Yugoslavia was if you looked at the in the inside of the plastic cover, I have a picture of this here, there's a there's a like a mark an engraving that says TBS and it says Eunice up here, and um, that's the only way that you would know that this machine was made in Bogonio and not in in uh, Western Germany. So the Germans were sort of outsourcing their machines and weren't being honest about the fact that these machines were being made in Yugoslavia. Now um, the. Yugoslavs got so good at making these machines that they were also able to get some really lucrative contracts with Olivetti in Italy um, to make the Laterra 32, which was also an extremely popular model at this time. And um, in this period of time in the late 1980s, they were widely recognized, Yugoslavia was widely recognized as a place to outsource for Western um, companies that were manufacturing keyboards for computers. So they were making the transition to computers. But as I'm sure you could um, probably guess, the factory was destroyed during the Bosnian War and would never again reopen after the 90s. There was a beautiful article in 2018 by a guy called Obrad Kisic, who I was able to contact an interview in um, Serbia while I was there. Um, and this is a quote from this article. According to official indicators, the Bogogno office machine factory was among the leading manufacturers of office equipment in the Serbian Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Well-informed people remind us that preparations for the production of computers and other IT equipment started in the early 90s, but the beginning of the war stopped these plans. Unfortunately, this is the story of another fallen Bogonian economic giant extinguished in the war and the post-war period. So there was this sort of thriving office machine industry that was just utterly um, destroyed because of the conflicts in Yugoslavia in the 90s.
So the, the third model that I'm looking at and, and the final three models, I am still in the process of doing research on, so I'm not gonna be as detailed. I'm in the process now of writing the article that is gonna be about the UNS TBM. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure whether this will be a book or a series of essays or maybe a documentary film. I have no idea what I'm gonna ultimately do with this. But the Zeta Consul um, company in Czechoslovakia, again, fascinatingly, these office machines um, were made in a factory that also made um, arms, guns, armaments um, in Brno. And they held a Remington license and developed typewriters um, called the Zeta. This is the model Zeta beginning in 1948. So immediately after the Second World War. And around 1960, the Zeta morphed into the Consul, uh, which was originally a subset of the Zeta typewriters, but they eventually phased out the Zeta and really doubled down on the Consul. And these Consuls were manufactured until the mid 1980s, and they represented about 10% of this arms manufacturing uh, factory in Brno, about 10% of the 10,000 employees, 1,000 employees were involved in making these Consul typewriters. The console, like the Maritza and the Unis TBM, had huge export markets. This is really quite surprising, but they were everywhere. Uh, they were exported to Canada, to Sweden, and of course to the USSR and all around the global south. Um, the console in particular was um, famous for its Arabic typewriters. And the thing about the Arabic typewriters is that the tooling had to be rejiggered because the, the carriage moved in the opposite direction. Um, and, and so that, that meant the insides of the typewriters had to be switched. So there were big economies of scale if you were going to be exporting to the Arabic market for typewriters. There's a lot of really interesting uh, research that has been done on the role of Czechoslovak and German typewriters in Czechoslovakia during the Cold War as it relates to the production of Samizdat. So this is a quote um, from an article talking about Samizdat in Czechoslovakia. Communism created a typewriter culture in Czechoslovakia. While publication of books without approval through the state censors was forbidden, manuscripts, monographs, and short stories were not illegal per se. Obviously, if the content was anti-state and it became widely known that you were participating in seditious activities, you could be arrested. But there was a loophole. If you hand typed your work, bound it, and signed the front, you were merely distributing a manuscript. It was a tenuous precaution against being accused of spreading unauthorized publications, but it worked. Thousands of publications of Czech Samizdat were typed and distributed in a network of underground manuscript sharing. And in, a, in an article on uh, Samizdat in Czechoslovakia, one dissident writer remembers typing Samizdat texts where the front page read, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that in Czech, um, which uh, translates as an explicit ban on further reproducing this manuscript. So the acronym VZDOR, which is this sentence in Czech, also means resistance in Czech. So it was like this way of circulating, saying that this manuscript was not being circulating, but then in fact marking this manuscript as something that needs to be circulated because it is fulminating uh, against the state. It is an act of resistance. Also, my colleague Katarzyna Lishkova, who was extremely helpful in uh, helping me do some of the early research on the console typewriters, also remembered having a console at home. Um, and like uh, Teodora in Bulgaria, she remembers creating her own experimental poetry on it, uh, the graphic form of such poetry being crucial. Uh, the final two models that I'm going to be researching are the Erika in Eastern Germany, as well as the Groma. And the Erika uh, is a fascinating um, model because the strengths of the type bars. So when you hit a key on a typewriter, for those of you who have never used a typewriter before, you hit a key, uh, depending on the model, how hard you hit the key is gonna influence how hard the type bar strikes the paper on the platen. 
And some models require less force. One of the reasons that there are electric typewriters is because typing for a long time can be really hard on your hands. And so electric typewriters make it so that you don't have to hit the keys very hard in order to have the type bar strike the platen. But with a manual typewriter, they're, they're calibrated differently. Sometimes it's a very light touch and sometimes it's a very heavy touch. This Erica model was famous throughout the Eastern Bloc, but particularly in Czechoslovakia and Poland and the GDR, because when you were typing on an Erica, if you had onion skin paper and carbon paper, you could make a stack of six to eight pieces of paper with five to seven pieces of carbon paper between them, roll that into the typewriter. And then if you were writing a Sami's dot manuscript, you literally had six to eight copies of that manuscript from the carbon paper because the Erica had such a strong bar that could strike the platen that it could make six copies with carbon paper of the same manuscript. So back in the day before electronic communications and Xerox machines, being able to produce six copies of the same thing at one time was a huge advantage. And most other East European typewriters did not have the strength of the type bar to do that many copies at the same time. So these Erica models were highly sought after. The other model is the Groma, um, which uh, I actually have not done much research on yet. Uh, it was a very popular model that pre-existed the Second World War and then the production of this model. And it was also, there were many, many of these machines that were floating around in Eastern Europe, not as popular as the Erica because the key um, striking capabilities of the Groma weren't as strong as the key striking capabilities of the Erika. So in Poland, my colleague Agnieszka Kozianska was also helping me understand typewriter culture there. And uh, she, her husband's uh, uh, parents, I believe, um, are friends with a journalist who was explaining the role of typewriters in Poland. And in her recollection, she remembered getting a typewriter in a secondhand shop in the 1970s. It was an Underwood, uh, a British model, adjusted to have Polish diacritic signs. It was expensive, but not very expensive because she could afford it while having her first job. Later, um, during martial law, she used it to copy some underground materials. But here's the interesting thing about the Polish case, according to this journalist, which is unlike in Romania and the GDR where these um, machines had to be registered and were heavily controlled by the state. And unlike in um, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia where the machines were pretty freely available, the way that the Poles dealt with this was that their um, typewriters were relatively easy to get, um, to buy, but it was very, very difficult to get paper. So that was the way that the government controlled the flow of information. So this journalist and partner, it was also, there were many, many of these machines that were floating around in Eastern Europe, not as popular as the Erica because the key um, striking capabilities of the Groma weren't as strong as the key striking capabilities of the Erika. So in Poland, my colleague Agnieszka Kozianska was also helping me understand typewriter culture there. And uh, she, her husband's uh, uh, parents, I believe, um, are friends with a journalist who was explaining the role of typewriters in Poland. And in her recollection, she remembered getting a typewriter in a secondhand shop in the 1970s. It was an Underwood, uh, a British model, adjusted to have Polish diacritic signs. It was expensive, but not very expensive because she could afford it while having her first job. Later, um, during martial law, she used it to copy some underground materials. But here's the interesting thing about the Polish case, according to this journalist, which is unlike in Romania and the GDR where these um, machines had to be registered and were heavily controlled by the state. And unlike in um, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia where the machines were pretty freely available, the way that the Poles dealt with this was that their um, typewriters were relatively easy to get um, to buy, but it was very, very difficult to get paper. So that was the way that the government controlled the flow of information. So this journalist and part the back of the truck open and they were able to steal, um, <laughs> they were able to steal two reams of paper. So 
in uh, the last part of my presentation, as I said, uh, I hope you will forgive the very amorphous amount of information that I'm just sort of throwing at you, lots of facts and details and histories about these different typewriter models, plus all of the work that I, I still have to do. Um, I'm, I'm playing around with one theoretical framework and a couple of different ideas of directions where I might like to go with this presentation. Um, the first is that um, I want to think about this idea of new materialism. So in my field, in, in cultural studies, there has been a move to kind of decenter uh, the anthropocentric worldview of anthropology and the Western social sciences to consider what they call the agentic capacities of inanimate objects as a way of destabilizing the imagined boundary between the physical world of things and the ideational world of human thoughts and of action. Um, whoops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, there we go. So I'm here referring to Jane Bennett's 2010 book, Vibrant Matter. Um, they, these new materialists, and they sometimes call themselves post-humanists, tend to think of things as lively, dynamic, agentic, or alive, animated by some capacity for action and meaning making. So they're basically saying that there's a kind of agency that lives in these objects um, that machine there is one of the gromas that I'm going to be doing research on. Um, so this is a quote, thing power gestures towards the strange ability of ordinary man-made items to exceed their status as objects and to manifest traces of independence, of aliveness, constituting the outside of our own experiences. So just translating that into sort of normal English, basically, like when I have a typewriter or when a typewriter is, is circulating around in the underground of Czechoslovakia or somebody's burying a typewriter in their backyard in Romania or burying a typewriter in the hallway of their apartment in the GDR, the typewriter itself becomes a kind of agent. It becomes, it participates in the human agency of producing resistance in that case, specifically producing resistance in the East European case, but also in the case of like teenagers writing poems for the first time. I mean, obviously you can write poems by hand using a pencil and a piece of paper, but there's something different. There's something uh, embodied about the experience of writing poetry on a typewriter, especially if you're a teenager and growing up in a socialist country. There's a, there's a way in which the typewriter, or, or in the case of Dragostinova's father, wanting to write a memoir and needing a typewriter in order to feel like you're doing something in the right format. The typewriter itself becomes something of an agent. And in the case of the article that I wrote about the Plovdiv typewriter works and the kind of corrupt privatization of that factory in the 1990s, I really spent a lot of time talking about the agent's the agentic capacity of typewriters as sort of things that embody nostalgia about the socialist past, particularly about the socialist industrial past. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the ways in which objects, memory and memories about the past in here, in particular inanimate objects in specific ways. And unlike, you know, unlike some objects which are, you know, really, fully independent of human intervention. I think things like typewriters and cars, uh, you know, maybe things that you cook with, where there's, there's, there's the, like the, the object doesn't do anything by itself. It requires human intervention. There's a weird symbiotic relationship between objects and humans, and that there's this sort of dual or, um, codependent agency that develops between the world of the object and the human world. And, and I think that's a really interesting framework to think about how typewriters might allow us to tell a slightly different or unique history of socialism and post-socialism in Eastern Europe. So the first thing that I'm thinking about is using the typewriter as a lens to understand differences in 20th century East European socialist regimes 
towards free expression and dissidence. So um, in the, if I were to do this in the case of these models, I would really, I'm really interested in looking at the ways in which socialist governments over time and different socialist governments regulated people's access to typewriters. Were you able to buy a typewriter? Were they fairly cheap? Did you have to register them with the police? Were they illegal? Were they considered weapons? If you got a typewriter, could you get paper? What kind of paper? How um, were the typewriters calibrated so that you couldn't make carbon um, copies? So in some cases, there's evidence that these East European typewriters were specifically calibrated so that you couldn't make multiple copies of a manuscript, unlike the Erica. Uh, to what, like, how did they decide, um, you know, who got them? What were the, the rules of access? How did that change over time? There's a real uh, divergence in these East European uh, socialist countries in the 60s, 70s, and 80s about who is able to have access to typewriters and why, and whether or not manuscripts could be circulated freely if they weren't officially published. So I think that's really interesting. And I'm interested very specifically in the East European story of this. I'm not looking more broadly at the Soviet Union, at least not yet. The second thing that I'm really interested in is the way that we could use the typewriter to trace international trade flows between the second world and the first world, as well as the second world and the third world during the Cold War. So in my personal experience, I have bought a Erica with a Finnish keyboard at a flea market in Helsinki. I bought a Czechoslovak console with an Icelandic keyboard at a flea market in Reykjavik. Um, I have found lots of interesting, uh, I found a Greek uh, keyboard Unis TBM in a flea market in Athens. And so, and I'm sure uh, that if I were to travel more broadly in um, the global South, many of these machines still exist and are still being used in a lot of places around the world today, all tracing their roots back to the Eastern Bloc. Um, and also all of these rebranded Western models. So the Bundys and the Omegas and the Waverleys and the Lemaires and all of the models that were rebranded. Most people have these typewriters that they don't even have us, they don't even know that they were made in socialist Yugoslavia or socialist Bulgaria, which I think is really interesting. That was a choice that these corporations made to hide their socialist provenance. And, and it's also important to think about the ways in which, like in the, in, in the East German case, the big conglomerate um, that made the Erika typewriters very late on in socialism was Robotron, which was also going to be making computers. And um, I don't know if anybody remembers Compaq computers um, in the late 80s or late 80s were actually East German uh, computers. They were rebranded and being sold to the West. And uh, again, as I said, there are these big office machine aficionados in the world, and many of them are very, very interested in the history of Robotron, um, the East German computer manufacturing. Bulgarians also made a computer called the Bravitz, which was based on the Apple IIe. Um, and so the Bulgarians were also moving into making computers. Had the Cold War not ended when it did, many of these countries would have moved on from off manual office machines um, they made electric typewriters, often they made printers, the Bulgarians made Xerox copy machines for a while, but they would have definitely moved into computers, and it would have been possible that many, many, many of us today might be using East European computer products, and certainly in the developing world where these products were cheaper, um, they might have been distributed more broadly. And then finally, and this really comes out of the work that I did for the article in Siege, um, using the typewriter as a way to understand um, the way that Western markets took over East European manufacturing in the wake of 1989 and 1991, and really looking at the deindustrialization of Eastern Europe after 89. So, like, what happens to these factories? And um, and it, it you know in some cases it's really sad to just see the utter dismantling of these East European factories. They get bought out by Western um, investors, or they get privatized by shady domestic investors. And then the tooling and the buildings and all of the infrastructure is either sold off for scrap or sold to international, you know, bidders. It's it, and these and the, the local people are completely unemployed and the entire factory just 
you know, ceases to exist in a very short period of time. Or in the case of the Bogoño factory, it's bombed during the war and it's never repaired. So that's it. Thank you. Um, I uh, I have a lot of, uh, you know, random information about um, East European typewriters, but uh, I'm in the process of sort of trying to find a way to figure out an argument or to figure out an idea about how to frame this or, or package it in a way that's that's not just me totally fangirling over East European typewriters, but is actually something of a, of a scholarly project. Um, but I'm not, I mean, in all honesty, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. So I'm very uh, grateful and looking forward to your questions and comments. And especially if you have any experiences with East European typewriters, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I just want to go find a typewriter now and explore all the various options, the keyboard, lift the chamber to see if, you know, there's some markings that I would recognize. Um, and the three points you make, I mean, I want to read them all. I'm curious because, I mean, there are so many ways you could go with it. And it brings back memories. Our second lecture of the series, Trisha Stark spoke, spoke about cigarettes and Soviets. And the cigarette kind of being that thing, it made me think of when you mentioned Theodora's father, needing the typewriter. I mean, the cigarette and the typewriter almost goes well together. So um, it was just a great way to pair it. And also to explain some of these objects, I've been to flea markets. So, so to see them, and I'm sure some of the sellers would probably want you to tell the story back to them. Like, I'm gonna buy this thing and let me tell you all about it. Um, so yes, I welcome anyone in the audience. We have the Q&A box down um, in the lower right-hand corner of the Zoom window. If you could input your questions there, um, I will then read them out and, um, Professor Godsey will answer them. So we have one coming in. Um, thank you for sharing this wonderful project today. Really fascinating material. I'm curious to know what are the gendered aspects of East European typewriters you've observed? I'm thinking in terms of factory floor, distribution, consumption, and use, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. This is a huge part of, of, of the story because particularly portable typewriters, so, so just from the terms of uh, use, portable typewriters are, um, are very gendered female. Like they were literally, so you have these desktop models that often live in um, offices, but the portable models, the lighter models were made for women um, to be able to carry around. And of course, women ended up doing a lot of the secretarial work, as we know, that's still the case, right? That, that, that this kind of administrative work is very gendered female. So the typewriter is also a very unique object from the point of view of what we might call pink collar workers. Now, it also has this aura of right of writers, right? The cigarette and the and the um and the uh, and the typewriter. So there is also kind of a male imagination. So I think the typewriter is a really interestingly gender flexible object, right? Because it can it can signal a kind of professional administrative staff. But it can also signal the mystery and aura of being an author. And so those things are, are really um, compatible and, and interesting to look at. In terms of production, um, it is in, in fact the case that a lot of um, that production was heavily feminized in, in some of these lighter industries. Now that really, it differed in different countries and it differed at different periods of time. But it is true that there's very, very fine tooling. Initially it was um, a lot of men working because they were arms manufacturers first, but then once they went over to office machinery, the, the, the clientele changed, the, sorry, not the clientele, the, um, the employee, the, the employees changed and it, it started to become more and more feminized. Um, and so when these factories went out of business in the nineties, it was largely women who lost their jobs. Um, and so there's a lot of bitterness and anxiety and frustration uh, around, around that as well. And then finally, I just think it's really interesting to think about dissidence and the gendering of dissidents, because in the same way that um, you have the aura of, of, of writers and their cigarettes, you know, dissidence is also somewhat gendered male. Um, and yet what's really interesting, and so you'll you think about when these typewriters were being used for personal use, um, or, you know, to produce dissidents as so well um, d d depicted in uh, the lives of others, that's sort of the paradigmatic case. Um, it's men 
who are writing dissidents. And to the extent that we think about women writing on typewriters, they're writing their poems and typing up recipe cards or whatever. So I want to kind of challenge that as well. I think that there were a lot of women also writing dissident texts. It's just that we tend to gender dissidents in a particular way. And so one of the reasons that I think that it would be fun to look at the different ways that typewriters were regulated in different East European countries during the Cold War would be to look at well, who had access to them? Is it that women had more typewriters because somehow the government imagined that women were less dangerous with the typewriter than men? Um, because they'll be typing up their recipe cards or whatever in their poems rather than writing against the state. And to the extent that women did have access to typewriters, maybe disproportionately to men, were they then you know, sharing their typewriters like Teodora D'Agostinova was, right? And like creating kind of little typewriter. I mean, you can imagine like a group of people coming together over a typewriter, access to a typewriter. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear more of those stories and definitely will take into account the gendered and class, um, you know, aspects of typewriter use, ownership, and ultimately sort of distribution of the works that are produced by those typewriters. Um, the way, the way you, sorry, the way you put that, um, reminds me of like the female cook at home, the male chef in the restaurant. One seems to be better because I'm doing it as a profession versus I'm doing the everyday work. Um, we have a nice short question, but I think this was interesting because it didn't come up. Where did they find typewriter ribbons? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, they inked their own, right? So, so some type, like we in the West are used to um, disposable typewriter ribbons. Um, and I mean, there were disposable typewriter ribbons in the East as well, but more than more often than not, if I look at my German models in particular, the, the ribbon spools are metal. And um, what you would do, especially if you only had a single black ribbon later on, when you have black and red, it's very difficult to re-ink. Um, and so those have to be disposable. But early on, if you had metal spools, um, you would basically, you would get ink. Um, you could even make ink, but you could get ink and you would, it's very tedious, but it's not impossible. You basically go through the ribbon and you re-ink the ribbon. And so for some of my really old models, like I have models from the twenties, um, I can't, they're non-standard sizes. And so if I actually want to use those typewriters I have to like put gloves on and get out the ink and actually sit there and re-ink the ribbon, which is very, very tedious, but somewhat fun in a way, um, because you can you can actually um, you can actually use those type of, those ribbons sort of in perpetuity. And if the ribbon breaks, you can just get another ribbon and restring the spools. So so the interesting thing about these machines is that they were in fact more like environmentally sustainable as well. A good typewriter, like I said, I have machines from the 20s that are perfectly workable. As long as you don't drop them, um, they, they work forever. They really do. I mean, there are people who have you know, typewriters from the, the, the mid 19th century that still work really well. So, so they're very, very sustainable. Now, the one thing I will say that, which I think is actually just kind of a, just a little side note here, is that if you're using a typewriter for a nefarious purpose or illegal purpose, um, you definitely want disposable ribbons so that you can burn the ribbons afterwards. Because the ribbon, if you get somebody's ribbon, you can, if you're good, you can figure out what they were writing. And so disposable ribbons were controlled. That's precisely why they were they were so um, coveted, but they were controlled. So, and again, that varied from country to country. Um, in in um, Yugoslavia, if you had a Eunice TBM, like one of those Olympia Traveler Deluxe typewriters, those ribbons were everywhere. They were really, really easy to find. They were standard, they're still standard. I can still use a standard typewriter ribbon in all my Eunice uh, typewriters. Um, but, but, but yeah, re-inking, it's a pain in the butt, but it works and it, it's, it's infinite really. That's so interesting. I mean, so not surprising, but also surprising to hear. Um, here's one question. Um, and it kind of goes with your collection. Do you have any Chinese typewriters in your collection? No, not yet. Um, I'm working on that. That's a, that's a, the, the thing is, is that those, you know, those are not as prevalent in, in, in Europe. So, um, and I haven't been in China in a while. So, the, but the, and the, and the two times I've been to China, I didn't go typewriter collecting. So um, I will, that's something that I would really like to do. 
um, Japanese models as well, actually. I, any Asian models, Indonesian models, there's some great models out there, especially the ones that are made in the Eastern Bloc. I would love to have them. But um, I looked really hard when I was in Yugoslavia. I spent a lot of time um, going to different museums, for the Technical Museum. There's like a, a sort of a museum of writing, great museum of writing in, in Belgrade. And most people, until I come along, they don't even care about typewriters. Um, in fact, this museum of writing, they, they, they collect books from all over the world and they, they have this massive collection of manuscripts and things. And often when they get collections from writers, the, the family wants to donate the typewriter and the curator of this museum only begrud begrudgingly takes them because they're so heavy. And while I was there, I was going through the museum and I was taking pictures of all his typewriters. And he's like, that's so weird. <laughs> you know, and I was explaining to him why this model was so important, this model. And ultimately he decided, I think um, after our meeting that he's going to make a room in that museum that's just gonna be typewriters. Um, because I think that it does tell a lot about the writer, like what model they used and, and, and the relationship that they had with their typewriter. So, um, but I have not yet come across the Chinese models, which I'm, you know, I'm eager, I'm eager to uh, to acquire. <laughs> well, now that you've gotten this all on board, I'll keep an eye out when I go to the flea markets <laughs> in Chinatown in Oakland. Um, but no, maybe we'll find some interesting Soviet related, you know, we'll bring an area studies full circle. Um, uh, we have another question. Um, and let's see where it is, sir. I'm fascinated by the physicality of the work of typing on manual typewriters, the kind of debility it could cause to one's hands, arms, back, etc. Have you run across archival or narrative evidence of typewriter work-related disability, so to speak? And is there anything specifically East European about it? How about any therapeutic interventions for typists? Again, anything specific to East Europe here? Yeah, I haven't gotten that far in that research. I mean, definitely the physicality of typing is, you know, for carpal tunnel, for anybody who's ever worked for a really long time on a typewriter, it's really stressful on your fingers and your wrists. Um, I myself have had that problem. Um, in fact, the, the reason I have one electric typewriter is because for a long time, I would write my field notes on typewriters and I gave up um, with my manuals because I was really hurting my hands and I needed to use an electric. Um, so I got a good electric typewriter and it really makes a huge difference. So, so, so keyboards are a huge improvement, but that's a great point. Um, the, the, the disability of it, but you know, I don't, I, I haven't, I, I, you know, I just don't think people worked the intensity of hours that we work today in front of our computers on typewriters, partially because typewriters kind of force you to make a take a break because it hurts, right? It's physical. The other thing that I think is really interesting is the sound of typewriters. Like you, you can hear somebody writing in the way that you can't really hear somebody writing when they're right, working on a computer. And, 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 and the sound of a, of a room full of typewriters is a really interesting sound as well. And so there might be some disability, like the noise of typewriters is also a really interesting question. It's not just the physicality of the wrist, but the, the sort of cacophony of typewriters. Um, you know, it was interesting back in 2014, 2015, when I was living in Freiburg, Germany, I, like I said, I would regularly type up my field notes. And I had an upstairs neighbor who happened to be my landlord. And one day he came down and knocked on my door and he said, are you using a typewriter? And I was like really embarrassed. I thought, oh my God, you know, it's kind of early in the morning. Maybe I woke him up. This is really terrible. You know, it's noisy. And, um, and he, and I said, yeah, I'm sorry. It's an old manual typewriter. And I was sort of being apologetic and he's like, oh no, 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 no. I love that sound. Could you make a recording on your phone and send it to me? <laughs> so, so there was also, there's a nostalgia of the sound, you know, of, for those of us who are old enough, um, the sound of somebody working on a typewriter is a really interesting thing, but it could be positive and negative if it becomes really noisy. Um, to kind of riff off that for one second, one could almost probably do an analysis of typewriter related furniture or, and maybe you have them at um, University of Pennsylvania, but outside of my office, there's one of those typing tables, the metal one that every office seems to have and we can't get rid of. Um, <laughs> it just would be interesting to kind of follow up on the materialities of what went with it and what is discarded and what are we stuck with now? Sometimes. Yeah, no, exactly. And then certain things like, you know, carbon paper, whiteout, 
typewriter ribbons, little um, um, typewriter brushes. I, you know, I collect all these weird detritus things. What, it's not just when I go to flea markets and, and thrift stores, I don't just collect the actual typewriters. I love the typewriter paraphernalia. Uh, so the cases of the typewriters are often very beautifully designed, um, really they're ergonomically thought about like how heavy it, it's going to be. Um, so, so for instance, the console typewriter that I bought in Reykjavik, I bought it from the owner who went to elementary school holding, like carrying this Czechoslovak typewriter with an Icelandic keyboard. And it was, and it's a small diminutive model. I wish I had a picture of it. It has a little ladybug sticker on it, which I think is so cute. Um, and she said that she remembers as a child walking back to school forth to school with the typewriter. So the typewriter was specifically designed with this nice case with a zipper, very easy for a child to zip and unzip to get the typewriter in and out. It's light, it's portable, it's kind of cute. So, so it's also about like, who are the people using the typewriters and all of the paraphernalia that allows people to use typewriters in a particular way, in a particular context. I think that's also really interesting, definitely. And furniture, you know, don't even get me started. That's like a whole nother thing, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the history of furniture in the sense of things that were made for things like smoking stuff and no one smokes anymore, you know. Um, we have a question about Cuba and this, you might know parts of this. Were typewriters regulated in Cuba after 1959 and where did Cuba get its typewriters from? I, I do not know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. Um, I would guess that Cuba was probably in these exchanges with the Eastern Bloc and that probably in the early period, it got its typewriters from Eastern Germany. And then in the later period, probably from Bulgaria and possibly Yugoslavia. Those were the big typewriter production um, sort of place and obviously Czechoslovakia as well. So, um, but I don't know, I, I, that's, a, that's a great question. And it's something that I should definitely look into, but I don't know, you know, I'm sure I could ask some Cuban intellectuals of a certain age and they would know, but I don't have the answer to that question. I'd also, it's, it's just, I mean, this is a fun topic because we can go very academic and get deep and we can also kind of be surface level. It'd be interesting to see like an eighties JC Penny catalog for Christmas with like the typewriter section to, and now having taught us some of this to decode like, oh, these are all the East European ones and that's yeah. like an American one. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing about it is the typewriters were outsourced pretty e pretty early on, which I think is really fascinating that, that um, and, and, and like I said, I think it's really interesting that the Germans were producing their typewriters in Yugoslavia and not saying so. Right. So, you know, like Apple phones will say like designed in California, but manufactured in China. Right. And I'm not exactly sure when that rule came in that you had to say the country of manufacturer because the Germans were not doing that in the 80s, which I think is so. And so they were basically selling German typewriters, which were not made in Germany. Um, and as I said, the only way you can tell and, it, you know, it took me forever to figure this out, like, how do I know, you know, and it was. I literally had a magnifying glass and um, I was searching all over the typewriter, looking all over it. And then, you know, just on a whim, I, I looked at the cover and that's when I saw it. So it really subtle branding inside that said that it was made in, in, in Bogogno. But if you didn't know what those letters meant, TBS or Eunice, or to, sorry, TBM or Eunice, you didn't know that that was a Yugoslav typewriter, which I think is really, and so like the one, the Greek model that I have, I have a, 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 a Eunice TBM that's branded as an Olympia Traveler Deluxe with a Greek keyboard. Nobody would know that that machine was not made in Germany unless you happen to be a typewriter collector and you know where to look. And yeah, going through a JC Penney's catalog or Montgomery Ward or Sears, um, not to mention Neckerman in the U, in, in Germany, there were U, big UK um, branches and in Australia, the department stores almost I mean, probably like poor people in those countries, if they had a typewriter, if they had access to a typewriter, I would guess that probably 80% of them, the cheaper models were all from Eastern Europe. Yeah, that makes sense. Which weird. nobody knows, right? Nobody realizes, even like big typewriter, you know, aficionados today, they'll stumble across these models. Like what's a Waverly? What's a Lemaire, you know? Um, and, and they're like really shocked to be like, oh, that was made in Bulgaria. Okay. Um, that's weird. So yeah. Um, and just kind of to follow this, I play guitar and I have guitar pedals 
one, there's a whole Soviet slew because of course, Western stuff wasn't allowed there, which I haven't dived into. But the interesting thing that you bring up is Amazon's kind of been doing a lot of these things where they'll license someone's, and I follow the discussion boards and people be like, if you open it up, you'll see that the circuit board says like the original company that they've just bought like another company's circuit board. Um, so it's interesting that this does still happen. Yeah. Um, and it's not new, but it it's interesting to hear it in the East European context because we don't really consider them the producers anymore like they might have been back in the day. Um, so one, um, have you, or have you interviewed anyone who's still alive that has worked at the factories? I'm kind of refashioning the question. Yeah, I did a little of that in, um, in uh, Bulgaria um, it, when I was in Plovdiv. And, 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 and mostly the only thing they wanted to talk about was the privatization because it, they, were, they were very, very upset at the way that it was handled. It was very corrupt. Um, I mean, it was it was disgusting. If you if you're interested, the article is in um, Siege, uh, just from I think it's the la latest issue, and um, and I couldn't really get much else um, because of the just the level of bitterness. And I talk a little bit about that in that article. When I was in Serbia. I couldn't interview anybody in Bolgonio because there were COVID restrictions that made it very difficult for me to get from Serbia to Bosnia. Um, it was not a great time to be doing that research. So, um, but that, that's something that, yeah, I'm interested in thinking about as well is, is the experience of working in, in these um, factories. And I, earlier in the presentation, I had all these photographs that I, I was able to get from the archives in Plovdiv of the Plovdiv typewriter works manufacturing and, and how skilled the labor had to be, how precise that labor had to be in order to make those machines. Um, people were very proud of working in um, the Plovdiv typewriter works. That became very, very clear to me when I asked people in Plovdiv about it. But you know, a lot of people are older now, and um, and especially, I would say, I would say that there's a lot of nostalgia among that population for that period of time, and a lot of bitterness about what happened in the '90s. I can only imagine. I mean, I yeah. grew up in factory town and watched them collapse as I was a kid, um, and then come back weirdly much later with much worse benefits. Um, no, I, I appreciate this. This I know you're beginning this, but it was just fascinating to hear all these details. I mean, I think anyone in attendance will never look at a typewriter the same way again, or we'll always be lifting the lid just to see if we can crack the code. Um, but I, th I thank you. I thank you for rounding out our spring programming. I, I think there's one, somebody who's got a hand up. I don't know if I, you want to take that long last talk. question and then yeah. we can yeah wrap up, but I just, I just saw a hand. So let's try. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, ask to unmute. If you'd like to speak, um, if not, okay, then we'll have two more. Okay. Or maybe two more. I'm not seeing. Uh, yeah, I just saw the hand up, but I don't, yeah, okay. Oh, well. Oh, well. Uh, yeah. Well, and if people have questions, we can, you can always find Professor Godsey and email her through her um, personal website. Please check out, I've added it to the chat, her, um, the, podcast so if you have if you want more and you want to keep gathering information but hopefully we can get you back hopefully once this is in another structure um depending on which way you go it'll be fun to have you back and maybe get a couple more colleagues in material cultures small conference or something that would be great that would be absolutely fun refrigerators you know um yeah. bulgarians out there tushko peck you know <laughs> there's so many great things that we could talk about no, that sounds great. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. To everyone that's joined us over the course of the semester, um, thank you. Thank you for coming. All the videos are available on our YouTube um, our YouTube channel, and um, happy summer. That's what I really wanted to say the most. Happy summer. So thank you again. Everyone have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me and making me do all this stuff. <laughs> all right. No, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye.